Okay, um, I will call to order the uh, Transportation, Energy, and Utility Committee meeting at 5.06. Um, and I would entertain a motion on our agenda. I would move the approval of the agenda as written. Second. Is there any discussion? No, I have a copy of the. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> none. Seeing none, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And so we have our agenda. Um, also, here are the approval of the minutes from our uh, 725 and 81 meetings. Yeah, I move the approval of those minutes as drafted. I would second that. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And do we have approved our minutes from the last two meetings? So next on is public forum. Um, before we start public forum, I just wanted to sort of go over some ground rules for public forum. I'd like to limit public forum to the ordinance that we're discussing tonight and not other topics. Um, and I'd also, if you've spoken to us before, and if you have something new to say, then please say it tonight. Otherwise, we have it in the record. And um, if you haven't spoken to us before, we're glad you're here to talk to us tonight. Um, and uh, I'd like to get through this entire meeting in 90 minutes, if possible. So, um, you know, be as brief as possible to give us your thoughts during during public forum. And with all that said, we'll move on to public forum. And the first person I have on the list is Dave Kielty. Yep, well, okay. close enough. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Dave. So, so good evening. Thank you. I'm uh, my name's Dave Kielty. Kielty. I'm with the University uh, Health Network here on behalf of the University Medical Center to uh, provide a couple little comments. Uh, uh, what our perspectives are on the proposed ordinance in terms of what we've seen. Uh, we've been working very closely with the Burlington Electric and others. Uh, there was a memorandum, I think, that was distributed. You guys got that. I won't go through that in detail. There is a, a graphic that I uh, had associated with that. I did want to spend a little bit of time on that and uh, uh, only had a brief amount of time. So let me start off by saying is uh, UVM Medical Center has a commitment to sustainable building and design, green building. Uh, we have a number of these full uh, buildings. Uh, we've been uh, practicing sustainable design for the last uh, almost 20 years. Uh, we won a number of awards from Practice Green Health for green building. We're very proud of our of our record. In fact, when we build buildings now, um, we are seeing uh, energy consumption less than 50% of our comparable peer hospitals. So, for example, when you take a look at our Miller Building, the newest building that we uh, completed in 2019. The energy consumption there is uh, pretty close to uh, clu uh, e uh, EUI of about 100, which is exceptionally good for uh, hospital. Many hospitals are closer to 200. Um, the other thing I would say is that uh, this graphic kind of highlights is we have a very complex system. And uh, yeah, we just point a couple of things out on here. That little uh, cartoon uh, bubbles that you see around there. Those are systems that we do not have installed, but we're considering, and we're actually trying to understand in the context of this proposed legislation as well. But on the left-hand side of that diagram, you will see uh, that's our energy inputs, and they're largely, or if not all, metered utilities from Burlington Electric, which has obviously uh, got some uh, uh, some wind, uh, the hydropower, and uh, the big deal plant in terms of biomass. And we also procure energy from uh, Vermont gas, straight uh, natural gas, and uh, renewable uh, natural gas as well. And as you can see, when those enter the campus, they're, they're, they're needed. And uh, one of the things I was picking up on the last discussion, uh, the last meeting was a discussion about renewable gas. That's something that's not metered from source to, uh, to the medical center. That's procured on a contractual basis with Vermont gas it's blended to their overall gas and the amount that we buy. So when we get our gas on the campus, 
there's no gas molecules we could identify are natural or renewable. Uh, why I bring that up because uh, renewable uh, uh, natural gas will likely play a large role in our uh, ability to achieve uh, net neutral uh, 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 thermal energy on the campus. Obviously, uh, the high degree of reliance on the Burlington Electric uh, District heating that we're evaluating and having conversations now, trying to understand what the economics of that is. So between those two thermal sources, we think are probably a key for us to, to make some good inroads on in, in terms of carbon neutrality. Now, what's interesting here is when we those utilities and systems come off of the campus, we they go to our central plant, they may distribute all the other words, and that little pink area in the center kind of represents our central plant, where yes, we may consider electric boiler in the future. We have uh, traditional uh, water or fire tube boilers and water tube boilers currently there. One thing I would point out is some of those boilers that we have on the campus are close to 70 years old. So these these assets that we, we buy, uh, we take in, uh, very good care of and try to get as much life cycle out. I would urge caution in terms of the way that the fees may be assessed to make sure that you preserve the abilities and incentives for uh, modernization of combustion equipment going forward. I mean, a 70 year old boiler is doing the job and we would continue to maintain that. In terms of, I believe the tax provisions are, if we were to change that boiler out, we'd be subject to that uh, the carbon tax. So there's a lot of incentives for us to keep that equipment running for a very long time. The uh, other uh, illustration I have here is uh, with a with cartoon bubble, is steam absorption chiller. Uh, that would be, uh, we have had that in the past and we're considering into the future. Uh, that would be blended with our reciprocating and centrifugal chillers that we have in the campus to produce chilled water for space conditioning. Now, what we're in the memo addresses this, what we're trying to understand is in terms of the carbon tax assessment, and if it's based on connected uh, MMBTU of thermal capacity, how all that works together. Because on the far right hand side is equipment that we have in our buildings. Uh, for example, ventilation, heating, air, air conditioning, uh, duct system, which has thermal capacity. So when we build a new building, we may not do anything to the central plant. We're just going to plug into it and uh, build our, uh, our our hospital building and use those utilities that are there. So we're trying to understand how that carbon tax would translate to that because we're not sure whether if we build that building, it will be a tax assessed against the thermal, thermal uh, energy that that building would use. Uh, through that equipment. We're trying to figure out how that works with uh, with steam absorption, chilled water, and how that works with uh, with uh, a boiler that you may buy to, to power that uh, thermal, that uh, steam absorption chiller. So there's three pieces of equipment. There's the generating piece, which is a boiler. There's the chilled water generation, which is the thermal, uh, uh, the uh, absorption chiller. And then you have the end use, which is the, is the mechanical systems. So where is that tax assessed? How is it accounting for? Do you buy the boiler, do you pay the tax on that? But then you're, you have the same energy is being consumed by that absorption chiller. And that energy is still being, same energy being distributed by that uh, air handling system. So we wanted to understand that. It was unclear on how that would work. I call it energy accounting. I'm an energy engineer by, by training and uh, we're trying to figure out how you account for energy and those relative costs. So very interested in that. I think our memorandum kind of uh, summarizes that. I won't, won't get into it. In the, in question three, right, in your memorandum? Yeah, I wasn't really going by my questions, but okay. yes, it, it is. Uh, Thank you. Uh, the other uh, piece that I want to point out is in terms of boiler uh, electrification. Uh, I gave an example in the memorandum with a 100 horsepower boiler which equals one megawatt of electricity. Our total service uh, entrance for the medical center is about seven and a half, eight megawatts. Our emergency generation is about three to four megawatts. So a boiler horsepower of 100 is a very modest uh, amount of boiler steam capacity. In fact, we have 30 times that capacity in our central plant. So if we went to electrification and want to replace all of our steam generation, for example, it'd be 30 megawatts. It's, we're wondering whether that is doable 
uh, given our service entrance and the capacity of the overall uh, Burlington system, that 30 megawatts would be more than probably half of the generation capacity of the people. Uh, so just wanted to point that out uh, because it, it, that is a very expensive uh, to beef up your electrical systems for electrification on a you know, institutional scale. I think it works really good, well residential. I mean, I went to water source, our air source heat pumps in my house, uh, for example. But a large scale, uh, high intensity use like a hospital may not be, uh, uh, may not be feasible. So I uh, wanted to point those things out uh, and just have you be aware of that. I think the memoranda provides an overview of the other elements around temporary heating systems and systems where we may need to make modest investments to get us through the next five years before we tear a building down, understanding how that life cycle carbon tax assessment would be uh, approached in that scenario. So that's really all I wanted to cover. I wanted to appreciate the, the time to give you that information. And we're certainly going to be responsive to any questions that anybody has. So thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, the next person is Carol Tanzi. Yes, um, I'm Carol Tanzi. And um, I recently moved to, to Vermont to live closer to my family. Uh, lives in Irvine. And um, so I come from New York State, Albany, New York. And um, I'm not clear about how, how you're making decisions and the input. Um, it seems to me that you're, you've gone down a certain road um with biofuels and i'm here to say that i do not like biofuels as a solution to uh, climate change that we have to get um, the carbon out of the air and as i understand it bio means uh, of nature. So I don't understand how wood pellets would count as a green source. Um, I don't think it is. Um, it's burning wood. And it's adding to the to the climate change. So um, I guess I'm diametrically opposed to the gentleman in front of me, uh, but I'm just um, a newbie here, and I just wanted to give my input. Thanks, Carol. Yep. Uh, next, I have Elizabeth. I'm going to put your last name here. Pol Polchak. Pol Pol That's okay. Okay. Bye. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Polchek. I'm the Director of Sustainability at the University of Vermont. And um, my comments will mirror somewhat what Mr. Kelty, is it, said? Yes. Um, I think he illustrated very well the, the technical considerations in moving a campus or an institution like UVM Medical Center or the University of Vermont to um, clean energy, renewable heating systems. I submitted a letter that I think is part of um, today's materials. Uh, what I'm gonna say is, is largely echoes that. We released a comprehensive sustainability plan in April. Um, and in that plan, we declared a goal of carbon neutrality by 2030. So our goals uh, largely support the goals of the city to, to become net zero and to decarbonize. Um, I think we're in strong alignment there. How we're going to get there is complex and expensive, and it's crucial to us that we have as many tools available as possible. Renewable natural gas, like the medical center, um, and perhaps district heating are, are things that are, we, are, we are considering very seriously. So the deletion of those solutions, as has been a pro, uh, um, proposed from the carbon impact fee, we think would be um, to the detriment of the ultimate goals of fast decarbonization of our buildings. 
we're actively working on an energy master plan and developing a roadmap so that we have um, a better um, a better understanding of exactly what we need to do. But what we fully understand is that it's it's very technical and it's very complicated. And so taking any of those tools um, from the proverbial toolbox at this point, we think would be um, really challenging and make make the effort uh, more difficult. Um, I think, uh, oh, I, I'll just say that we were one of the stakeholders involved in the discussions um, with BED in the development of the carbon impact um, fee. And, you know, while we recognize that it's gonna, gonna be difficult for us, we were largely in support of the ordinance as, as it was written um, and it, as it was voted on. Um, so I'll, I'll close my comments there, thank you. It's Dylan is next. Who's next? Hi. Dylan. Dylan. Yes. Oh, Dylan. Yes, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Dylan Giambattista. I'm the director of public affairs for BGS. It's Vermont Gas. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come again. Uh, here we are two weeks later. And uh, there's been an opportunity now for all of us to review the amendments that were put forward at the meeting on August 1st. Um, and I just want to start by saying we appreciate uh, not only the chance to weigh in, but also uh, the chance to consider this proposal. And going back some time, it uh, wasn't long ago that the charter change proposal was brought through the General Assembly down in Montpelier. Um, and we testified at that time, uh, this was when you were discussing things such as the carbon fee and concept and whether or not it should be put to voters. And we did flag that with all the changing policy at the statewide level with the Global Warming Solutions Act and requirements to reduce emissions, that there was a concern that um, any attempt to impose a fee uh, above changing statewide policy would result in higher costs. But that said, we were encouraged that uh, after the voters made their vote in March, uh, everyone came together. There was a process to hear from stakeholders and impacted community members. And the proposal that was developed and brought to this committee um, in concept, we are pleased to say, aligns in large part with the emerging statewide thermal energy policy, most notably Act 18, which is the Affordable Heat Act. That's the new law that lawmakers uh, adopted that will transition the thermal sector in Vermont uh, in line with state requirements. I, I provided some comments, which uh, were in email form to Chair Barlow, which are now on the page of the committee. Um, but just to summarize here, I presented last week about our interest in seeing alignment with state policy. We think that that's in the best interest of the city and also of meeting our statewide climate objectives that the state has set out. Specific to um, some of the amendments that were put forward at the last session uh, that have been made available, um, I do just want to call out a couple areas of concern with those amendments. Uh, the first would be this concept of adding language to the effect of from exclusively renewable non-fossil sources. Uh, while we appreciate the intent of that, uh, under the state law, the Affordable Heat Act, um, all energy sources are going to be put through a life cycle analysis. Uh, this is one of the most environmentally uh, progressive policies of low carbon fuel standards in the country. And that process will compare on an apples to apples basis, the relative climate benefit of a given fuel type or a clean heat installed measure. I bring this up because here in Burlington, uh, the policy that's been developed uh, provides some flexibility in it, in that it provides a variety of pathways for large building owners, such as the ones who have spoken tonight, um, or new building owners in the future to achieve compliance uh, with this act such that they are not penalized by the carbon impact fee. And at the same time, they'll be choosing a fuel type that lowers their carbon footprint aligned with state policy goals and also the city policy goals here as well. Um, I'll just say that the exclusively renewable non-fossil source language uh, would not align with state policy. Um, and we have a concern that, you know, an energy user, um, as we've just heard, they use multiple energy types. So there might be scenarios in which an energy user wants to have a hybrid blend of energy types to meet their thermal needs. Um, in our instance, we might serve biomethane renewable natural gas through our system. Um, they might choose to use, say, 40% of that to service their load. The other 60% under the ordinance currently, uh, as introduced, could be serviced by advanced wood heat, biodiesel, or some other blend. Um, that would contribute to the climate goals. This language would prevent that. Um, I also just want to call out, there was discussion about deleting fuel or compliance pathways uh, that was put forward, specifically renewable natural gas, green hydrogen, biodiesel, uh, and advanced wood heat. Um, you know, at the statewide level, the Affordable Heat Act 
is going to very likely provide credit for those types of energy sources because it will be shown that they reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That law looks at the entire sourcing of all fuel types under it. It includes the production, transmission, and combustion here in Vermont. So as we look to align with state policy, um, I'm not sure why you'd want to delete fuels or compliance pathways that are set out in state law for transitioning the thermal sector. Also, I'll just call out that um, there's a statewide greenhouse gas accounting inventory. Um, so as Burlington sets out policy, uh, there's also been talk about adding a physical delivery requirement. Um, that policy, as I called out uh, in the submission that I made, uh, it's, it's focusing very closely on what Burlington can do, but it's not aligned with the state policy context of all of this. The greenhouse gas impacts of these fuel sources are going to be accounted for for impacts beyond Vermont's borders. This is really a North American-wide and global-wide policy framework that the state has adopted. So adding a physical delivery requirement within this policy uh, would not be consistent with statewide policy. We think it would drive up compliance costs uh, and would not fit in that emerging state energy context. The final, thing, the final thing I'll just say, thinking about the needs of new development, new buildings, uh, the users of those in the future, and existing building owners who would be impacted by the carbon fee ordinance um, there was talk about deleting the early action provision that would uh, award uh, actions that these buildings take early that reduce greenhouse gas emissions consistent with the climate policies of the city and the state. Um, and we think that it would be important to allow for those early action credits to provide a pathway for these organizations to pay transition. So I'll leave my comments there. That's the substance of what I have to say that's new. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to weigh in. If there are any questions specific to our system, um, I'm happy to answer them through the, the progress tonight. So thank you. Thanks, Don. Um, next up is Nick Persantieri. Hi, Nick Persantieri. I live in Ward 2. I strongly support the proposed elimination of lines 52 through 65, which would eliminate green hydrogen advanced wood heating, sustainably sourced biodiesel and renewable gas or from the permissible types of systems um, because those types of systems will not uh, help us to reach our climate goals. And I'm not going to repeat what I said before about those measures, but I just wanted to refer you to position papers on those types of systems that I submitted and 350 Vermont submitted, which are in the materials for the July 25th meeting of this committee. I uh, support elimination of the language that Dylan just mentioned, um, the language in uh, line 35, exclusively renewable non-fossil fuel sources such as but I think that language should be eliminated for a different reason. I think it creates a circular, and I don't think this is what's intended, but I think it creates a circular definition that defines, that would define a renewable fuel which reduces greenhouse gas emissions as any system that relies on thermal energy from exclusively renewable non-fossil fuel sources. And so that would read literally include any renewable source, regardless of its fossil fuel, regardless of its greenhouse gas emissions, including the things that you're proposing to eliminate. So I think that language either needs to be struck or to make it clear, maybe change it to exclusively renewable non-fossil fuel sources which reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I would strike the such as language, maybe say something like, or like particularly instead, because I, I think that we should prescribe with certainty what's allowed, and then if you're going to allow a catch all for the elect, for Berlin, for the division of permitting to allow some other type of fuel on is showing that it, it, it reduces greenhouse gas emissions, that's fine. But let's limit this to a prescribed list uh, with that um, K 
catch-all if we're going to include the catch-all. And I don't, I don't think we should even include the catch-all. Um, finally, um, as I've explained before and won't repeat it, um, we should not in, try to aim for incorporating verbatim language for the affordable from the Affordable Heat Act. I submitted something in writing on that. The Affordable Heat Act has designated measures that may be eligible for clean heat credits. The legislature is going to decide how much credit each measure is entitled to. That process hasn't been done yet. And our ordinance is fundamentally different than the Affordable Heat Act. The Affordable Heat Act is going to include a sliding scale of credits based on how effective a measure is in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So if they were determined to determine, and I don't think they should, that renewable gas sucks. And in contrast, the our, ta our fee is all or nothing. So it's just a totally different system. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, next, we have Phil Merrick. Hello, um, Phil Merrick. We're four now. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm here to basically show my support for uh, Nicholas Persantieri's uh, views here. Uh, I've studied some of these issues, and I can tell you I've studied some of them in depth. I'm going to tell you it's going to be hard for all of us. I'm sorry that uh, there at the medical center at UPM, you're having, I'm having troubles figuring out how I'm going to make my house net zero, aren't we all? And, and I'm not being sarcastic at all. We are in this together. We need to cut the carbon. I don't care if it's wood chips. I don't care if it's wood pellets. It's carbon. We've got to cut the carbon. This is a climate crisis. Um, I don't know if you people who are using regulations to figure this out, stop it. This is a climate crisis, do the right thing. It's not going to be overcome this crisis by waiting for those above. It is a fight that we will only win here as the combined result of individuals and small communities all across the world. This is not just Vermont. This is not just Burlington. We need to take meaningful and bold action, really, really meaningful and bold action. We don't have time for the cumbersome movement of federal and state governments. I know Dylan really like to go by the state, but they are slow. By the time they figure this biomass thing out, how many, how many more floods do we need to live through here? We can't wait for the politics and financial interests to iron themselves out. We already know what the problem is. It's carbon, carbon in the atmosphere. This is not a wait and see situation. Each individual community needs to act as quickly and fully as we can. We can't be experts at everything, but we must rely on those like Nick, like many other people I know. They're spending their days, their afternoons, their evenings studying this stuff to tell you experts what's really up, and it's called carbon. There are too many fronts and too many battles, as you are all well aware. None of us can be everywhere at once. When you throw in political, financial, and special interests and all the rest, the change is far too slow. But there are those disinterested people with the only goal being to save us full from a full climate disaster, and we must listen to them, like Nick. Nick is one of these soldiers. He has reviewed the issues in detail. He has an honest drive to make the difference. Trust his recommendations. We need to take this lead here in Burlington, and we need to do it now. We don't have time. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Steve Goodkind is next. Is there a mic up from the city? Who's here? 
um, I'm way back here. Welcome to speak loudly or join us closer to the front. Yeah. Hannah, can you hear us, Steve? Steve Goodkind, former city engineer and public service director for Burlington. I'm going to heed to what you said about what did not repeat. So just know I support everything Nick is saying, but just to know that I feel very strongly about the fact that we need language that would remove the deal from being one of the permitted sources of heat on your new ordinance. I hear an institutional and uh, commercial people here talking about how McNeil could be part of their decarbonization plan. I can't even believe they're saying it. And all I can say is if that's the case, maybe at this meeting we can meet under a bridge I want to sell you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Kim Hornum, Mary, did I put you your name? My name is challenging. I'm Kim Hornum Marcy. I'm an active member of uh, 350 Vermont Burlington Node. And I just rise to say that um, renewable does not mean no greenhouse gas emissions. And we need to get to a point where we are recognizing that uh, renewable natural gas is the same methane content as natural gas and that uh, biomass is one of the most toxic and inefficient and um, poor things we can burn. We have to stop burning everything. There are many green solutions for heating. And um, the Affordable Heat Act is a study right now. There's no guarantees how that's going to end up. But we worked hard on that bill to make sure that they would look at life cycle emissions. Renewable natural gas and biomass often have higher emissions than other fuels you burn. But we're not in favor of burning anything. We need to move to the green solutions. As I drove here tonight, I was listening to people who had lost everything in Hawaii. We have people who have lost everything right here in the state due to flooding. The man who was speaking had lost everything, and yet he was talking about wanting to serve. And so I beg you to serve the earth to serve the living systems of the earth. I, it is mind boggling to me that a university that has climate scientists and medical scientists all speaking the same language Nick and I and Phil are speaking and you are not listening to them. You cannot keep burning things. We have to quit now. We should have quit 25 years ago. We should have quit 70 years ago, but we can quit now, please quit. Thank you, Kim. Um, is there anyone else in the room who's not signed up who want, would like to speak? I, I do know there's someone online. I'm going to go to the online folks next. Oh, you're going to? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? No? Okay. Um, Maddie, who do we have online? Rebecca Schwartz. You should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Are you guys able to hear me? We are. Okay, great. Thank you so much for hearing my comments. I'm a Burlingtonian and I live in the Lakeside neighborhood, so I'm Ward 5, and I'm really glad that Burlington has been taking so much action and there's so much more we can do to reduce our carbon and the pollution that's really blanketing the planet. So as, as Kim just said, we can really see and feel the tipping point and I'm really urging the committee to be a leader, to be a really strong leader in bringing us to really net zero greenhouse gas emissions and bring that carbon way, way down. So having something be renewable is not enough. We can't change climate change with just language. We really need to incentivize and require that we not have more carbon more things burning, more greenhouse gas emissions. So I really urge you to make the changes to bring us to a much cleaner and greener city and really be a leader that um, is making those hard choices. And it is challenging, but we got to meet the challenge. And that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. Jack Hansen. Uh, go ahead, Jack. 
you're, you may be muted, maybe. We don't hear you. We're still not hearing you, Jack. You can come back. We can, we'll come back to you, Jack. Um, who's next? Ashley Adams. Ashley. Go ahead, Ashley. Hi there. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, first, I, I do want to clarify the state of Vermont is not a leader on clean energy and heat. Um, I find Vermont right now to be a leader in greenwashing. And I, I really don't think um, that the state level um, is is one to emulate at, at this particular point in time, unfortunately. We know that we need to phase out all forms of combustion from our heating and power sources if we are to stand a chance of meeting our climate goals. Um, it's not merely about fossil fuels, as Burlington's net zero energy roadmap suggests. It's about greenhouse gas emissions from every source, as so many folks tonight have um, stated. No additional research is needed. We know that renewable natural gas, green hydrogen, biodiesel, advanced wood heat, and McNeil district heat are heating sources which will increase greenhouse gas emissions and also have ecological and health implications. Calling something renewable, natural, green, or advanced matters not from a climate, ecological, or health standpoint. These are words used by those in power to hoodwink everyone else while they go on polluting and making the earth uninhabitable. Please consider your fellow Vermonters who have suffered from catastrophic flooding and wildfire smoke. We're living in the climate emergency daily, especially the poor and marginalized. Residents of Burlington who voted on the extremely misleading ballot item two that led to this ordinance thought they were voting to cut carbon emissions. We are all desperate for real solutions. You must enact an ordinance that achieves the spirit of what residents voted for. If you leave these false solutions in the ordinance, you will have failed in this critical task. So I applaud the idea of a thermal energy system ordinance, but it needs to be one that takes us forward. Please do not include renewable natural gas, green hydrogen, biodiesel, advanced wood heat, or McNeil district heat as permissible heat sources in this ordinance. These heating sources do not belong in any credible plan to meet our climate goals, whether it's the hospital, UVM, or the city. And I think you all know that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ashley. Looks like Jack has unmuted himself. Jack. Hey, everyone, can you hear me? We can. Okay, sorry about that. Thanks for letting everyone speak, appreciate it. Um, as others have said, we are in a climate emergency and we're already seeing pretty severe impacts, but really this is just a small glimpse of, of where things are headed with, with the impacts of the climate emergency. This is why Burlington adopted the net zero roadmap and declared climate emergency in 2019. It's because we're in this emergency and the state of Vermont is not is not solving the problem. The state of Vermont is failing to solve the problem. That's why you're in this room crafting policy at the local level to try to reduce emissions. The net zero energy roadmap is clear that the goal is to eliminate fossil fuel use and greenhouse gas emissions in Burlington by 2030. Now, this policy just looks at a small segment of, of that, that overall piece. But let's not, you know, let's at least get this segment there in terms of that 2030 timeline. Renewable, you know, having, having Vermont gas supply new buildings or having existing large buildings in, invest in new equipment to take gas from Vermont gas is not going to achieve that goal. If you look at Vermont Gas's website, their plan is to reach 20% of their supply coming from renewables by 2030. So you're talking about, you know, be falling, <laughs> reaching 20% of your goal by 2030. We're trying to get 100% off of fossil fuels by then in Burlington. Again, the fuel be being delivered to buildings the fuel being combusted here in Burlington. So that is not a viable pathway. And 
again, this is just looking at new construction and large buildings that are making new investments in um, in heating systems. And so if we can't even do it here, how do we expect to get all the existing buildings that are hooked up to natural gas off of that? It's it's just, there's there's no way we get there under this framework. So let's at least make sure that these new investments are going to the right place, which we know is electrification and, and geothermal. That's where we should go. And if they can't do it for technical reasons, don't have them pay a premium to a fossil fuel company to reduce emissions elsewhere. Have them pay a fee to the city, which was the whole design. This is why we spent years getting this authority as a city. Have them pay the city to decarbonize here in Burlington rather than having them pay this fossil fuel company to try to decarbonize elsewhere. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Peter Duvall. Peter Duvall, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Can you hear me okay? We can. Um, there, there are a couple of uh, assumptions in the room uh, right now. And uh, the first one that has brought this uh, very complicated um, interlocking uh, scheme between the carbon impact fee, the uh, S5, and the steam pipe, the steam transmission pipe proposal. The, the, the assumption throughout all of these things that are interconnected is the bad assumption that biogenic emissions are carbon carbon free, um, climate neutral, and it makes it makes these all three th all three ideas uh, fa fatally flawed. There's another there's another assumption in the in specific to uh, the action tonight. And that is the assumption that there needs to be some carbon impact fee ordinance or any ordinance at all. That's not the case. You are not required to create an ordinance. And it's just really um, a, a major setback to make such a backwards move as this ordinance and the other the other two uh, aspects of of this uh, whole scheme when we know that there are there are some pretty straightforward things that could be done that get the get so much accomplish so much more in the right direction and I'll point out again that it would be a very simple thing for Burlington to adopt uh, passive house zero building code with alternatives such as lead zero or uh, living building challenge, which is in its fourth generation, it's the, it's the best. Those would cover all buildings and all uh, new construction. That would be a far superior way to create a built environment that is ready for not the future, but the, the demands of right, right now of buildings that are that operate with zero energy and don't need massive infrastructure. Now they're <clears throat> shifting a little bit. The economics of this are terrible. And it doesn't, it, it, there's just uh, no way that the city can assume that McNeil will continue to operate. Looking at the 2020 uh, INRS 
economic analysis of the plant, it operated at a, over a $4 million deficit. That's money coming from ratepayers every single year to pay to subsidize the operation of the plant, just the operation. And on top of that, ratepayers in, in Connecticut are paying over $7 million a year or the, and did in 2019 for a total of over $11 million per year subsidizing the operation of McNeil, which generates the most greenhouse gas emissions of any stationary source in Vermont. I, I can't emphasize how upside down this is, that Burlington is conceiving to continue to pay way above market price for electricity uh, to, to generate this electricity, to have to have this high cost uh, generator, which doesn't actually supply electricity to the city, just is there to um, to burn wood chips. To do that and uh, not assess the risk that the uh, ratepayers in Connecticut will figure this out. And there they are, they are, they have, they're not going to subsidize the plant any longer. It's going to, you got a, like a, little, a couple of years left in this. Um, and that, that Burlington landowners and large building owners aren't going to figure out that this, um, that taking on the subsidy that's been provided by Connecticut is a really bad idea. Um, you need, before you move anything out of this committee, that risk must be identif identified and quantified. And it, it's the same risk with all of the other biofuels that you've been talking about, because all of them have been assumed to be uh, zero emission in their combustion. And that is just such a wrong assumption. I thank hope you you'll, I, I, I want to thank, uh, this is the end. I want to thank uh, Nick for putting so much effort into trying to uh, repair a fund, fundamentally bad idea and ordinance, but um, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's a turd and it's just, you can't polish a turd. It just doesn't work. So. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Had we're already at, uh, you know, almost an hour of public comment. We still need to deliberate on this um, ordinance. Um, so uh, Maddie has informed me we have, what, four speakers? Mm -hmm. um, for the remaining speakers, if you could keep your comments to the ordinance and be as as uh, terse as you can, um, but still give us your complete thoughts, I would, I would really appreciate it. So who's next? Ben Gordeski. Ben Gordeski. Ben, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? You can. A little right. echo. Okay, uh, I have a bad echo here, but I'll do my best. Okay, actually. Oh, you just lost him. You lost him? Yep. Cheryl Joy Lipton is next. Great. Cheryl Joy Lipton, go ahead and we'll come back to the Ben. Okay, thanks, Ben. Go ahead. Um, you've heard from me before, but I'll be, um, I have new things to say, and I'll try to speak quickly and be really succinct. And it does have, everything I say has to do with this ordinance. Um, and I'm uh, an ecologist in Chester, and this affects me also because you know why. I agree with the, uh, many of the previous speakers that are, not in favor of this ordinance as written and uh, agree with um, the changes that Nick Persampieri has suggested. Though I also agree with uh, Peter Duval that we don't need the ordinance. In the ordinance, whatever is not going to require a fee will be more desirable to people. So it's 
its use will increase. So the problem with increases in biomass and biofuels, including the continuation of McNeil, uh, and especially that, is the impacts uh, to the environment. Increased wood and biofuel use cause decreases in healthy, old, and mature forests. It'll reduce the forest that's recovering and really continue to add to the biodiversity crash in addition to adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Um, biomass burning is now known to be incredibly damaging in many ways. Many of the things you've heard already and you've heard tonight um, and you've heard in the past. Another point is that net zero is really not gonna help us right now. We need to have really zero emissions and using biomass, including from McNeil, eliminates the very things that are removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, while also it destroys the carbon storage in those things and puts that right into the atmosphere. You all know from past information given to you that burning wood is not carbon neutral. It's more carbon emitting than all fossil fuels, even worse than a coal plant. The fact is that McNeil is worse than a coal plant. And carbon isn't the only problem. Um, an import, uh, burning wood causes air pollution and directly harms human and ecosystem health. Carbon loss is predominantly due to far forestry, not development. And cutting trees for fuel, regardless is it if they're um, one of the arguments is using low grade wood, Regardless is it if they're straight for saw logs or bent, crooked, branched, et cetera, any other form of being low grade, releases more carbon in, um, than if they were continuing to grow in the forest or if they're dead to recycle carbon into the soil. Um, the UN states that biodiversity is our strongest natural defense against climate change. The conference COP15 in Montreal addressed the decline, dangerous decline in nature as a result of human activity, and that a million plant and animal species are now threatened with extinction. Damaging natural forest ecosystems is part of this problem, and there's less than 1% of forest, old forest remaining in Vermont. Vermont conservation design, the goal ha is to increase the percentage of old forest in Vermont. And this year, legislature passed Act, well, Act 59 with the same goal, increasing wood burning will decrease the percentage of old forest, not increase it, and exacerbate, exacerbate declining species diversity, increase general species like deer and raccoons, deer and the tick problem which is getting worse and worse, and decrease old growth in interior forest species, including the insects, pollinators, and all the species in the food web that support others, including humans. COP15 ended in December with an agreement to guide global action on nature through 2030, including restoring at least 30% of degraded ecosystems and reducing harmful government subsidies like wood burning subsidies, um, and which you're talking about here essentially in this ordinance um, by default. Continuing to degrade forest health by burning trees is not su sustainable and exacerbates the biodiversity crisis we're experiencing, a crisis with equal importance to climate change with equally devastating consequences. Um, this ordinance will act the same way by encouraging biofuels and biomass, wood biomass use. Also, from enhancing flood resiliency from of Vermont state lands in 2015 after Irene, they say, in light of increasing storm frequency, intensity, persistence, and magnitude, management for enhanced flood resiliency on state lands will require great em greater emphasis on forest health and stewardship of forest ecosystem services, including water retention, infiltration, and filtering. I just want to make one little thing that they are talking about state lands, but really this goes for all land. Yeah, not... Quickly, or if you have longer comments, you're also welcome to submit them in writing and we can add them to the meeting record. Okay, just... I will do that. I, I have just a little bit and I really want to, it's not much. A couple of sentences? Yep. Okay, because we have other speakers who are waiting to go still. Right. In, in degraded ecosystems, we are going to have worse problems with flooding. Um, and increasing wood burning will degrade the forests and the headwaters and streams and cause these worse problems. And this ordinance will increase wood burning and biofuel use, which also uses up land that we need to be supporting us. 
So here's an important point is that two groups formed by the Vermont Climate Council in 21 and in 22, both deliberated extensively and heard scientific and policy testimony. And they both recommended phasing out biomass burning. Um, Burlington should join a large scientific community that rejects the burning of biomass and biofuels because it's not a solution to either the climate or the biodiversity crisis and it harms health. Thank you. Vanessa Rule. Who's next? Vanessa Rule. Vanessa Rule. Hi. About uh, I'll be, four, I'll be four very four um, so I'm, thank you for letting me speak. I'm the lead organizer and co-director of 350 Vermont, and I'm here representing thousands of Vermonters across the state who will be impacted by your decision today because the climate crisis knows no borders. I moved to Vermont uh, from Massachusetts 12 years ago, and as someone who began working on climate in 2007, I was thrilled to hear in 2014 that 100% of Burlington's electricity was renewable. I was really glad to have moved to the Green Mountain State. And at that time, I assumed that biomass was a good thing for the climate. Uh, we've since learned that biomass and other biofuels are in fact not good for the climate. And it turns out that my old state, Massachusetts, knows this and doesn't allow it to count as a clean heat source, nor does New York State. And we cannot have Vermont trailed behind. This summer, we've all witnessed firsthand the alarming progress of the climate crisis. I don't need um, to remind you that Burlingtonians in particular suffered from the Canadian wild, wildfire smoke. The science is clear, we need to stop burning things as quickly as possible and not just fossil fuels, but biomass, liquid biofuels, renewable natural gas and hydrogen. This is well documented. Uh, proponents of these fuels invoke the life cycle analysis um, and experts from Cornell University, from the Institute for Policy Integrity and others testified in the state house to why the carbon intensity score models are deeply flawed. And I hope you've reviewed this information. This is why Massachusetts and New York do not consider these renewable climate friendly fuels. Um, and it makes complete sense why Vermont Gas, which has ties to an international gas company and utilities like BED would be championing these fuels. Biomass, biofuels, RNG and hydrogen are the alternative product that they depend on to keep their profits going. These companies are not designed to benefit people on the planet, they're designed to make money at any cost for their shareholders. And their voice is way too loud in this process and their interests the wrong ones. And unfortunately, this process is completely inaccessible to regular people. The deck is stacked. We need real solutions, not ones that make us think we're taking action, but in reality, ex exacerbating the problem. We must invest in truly low carbon future now in the form of energy use reduction, weatherization, low emissions thermal energy networks, and electrification from solar and wind. 350 Vermont wants to thank the Burlington City Council for all the work you're putting into addressing the climate crisis by finding alternatives to fossil fuels and passing a clean heat ordinance. But those efforts will be for naught if you replace fossil fuels with equally polluting and ecologically destructive fuels. Not only are you gonna continue accelerating, accelerating the climate crisis, but you will reduce our ability to adapt and urgently build resilience in the face of climate catastrophe. We have no time to waste on false solutions. By allowing biomass, biofuels, RNG, and hydrogen to count as renewable, we're digging ourselves a deeper climate hole and delaying and making more expensive the energy transition we must make if we're going to have a livable future. When I started this work in 2007, my kids were three and six years old. They're now, now 21 and 24. And I don't know how old the children in your lives are, but when I started this work in 2007, I thought about what the world might look like when my kids would be my age if we didn't act. And I thought we could do something. And I know now what the world is gonna look like and I know it's gonna get much worse than hell on earth if we don't act very quickly. And I don't think their future should be placed in the hands of corporations that have caused the problem in the first place. That's why you are so important and why people like me and so many people who can't be here tonight depend on, on you for leadership. You are the last bastion that is going to prevent us from from really not having a future um so i really hope that tonight you're going to take um the time to really consider the responsibility you have to all the children of this world not just burlington 
Um, their interests should be put over BEDs or Vermont Gas's interests and corporate interests. Um, and I would ask you to remove uh, the McNeil District heat, biomass, biofuels, renewable natural gas, and hydrogen out of the clean heat ordinance, uh, consistent with the changes proposed by uh, Nick Persempiedi in his comments. Uh, please don't join in in making Vermont the greenwash mountain state. We need municipalities like Burlington to lead for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're in an hour of public comment. I would uh, ask the committee if they would be open to closing public comment and maybe instructing any remaining speakers to um, submit their comments in writing. I would move that even though I have been an advocate for vigorous and long public hearing, but uh, and I'm willing to stay beyond the, the half hour, but um, it would be most helpful for us to get into our deliberations and to solicit comment uh, in writing and uh, at our next meeting, which is next week. And therefore, I would move to close uh, public comment. I would second that. Okay. okay. And um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, it's for the for the speakers who are online who didn't have a chance to speak tonight. Um, this ordinance does not end with this committee either. It goes on to ordinance and then we'll have a hearing before the full council. So this is not the end of this ordinance. It's just one stop along the way. Um, so there will be other opportunity if you didn't have a chance to speak tonight. And if you submit your uh, comments in writing, we will add them to the meeting record, which as has been our practice uh, throughout these hearings. So thank you. Um, which brings us to um, the main event, which is um, more deliberation on this ordinance. Um, I'm, I was hoping that we would be able to conclude tonight with this, since this is our, our third meeting on it um, here in two. And we know that ordinances, like I just mentioned, is also taking it up before it heads to the council, and who knows how long it will um, it will be uh, deliberated on there. So um, one of the things I would like the committee to agree to is, you know, what, what our work product is tonight. Um, we, had, we had spoken in pre previous meetings that if we had uh, unanimity on certain amendments that we could um, perhaps agree on, we would um, maybe add those to the, uh, the draft that was referred to us. Um, and we could mark up that copy. If there were things that we did not have um, consensus on, unanimous consensus on, that we might um, we might forward our comments or, or or provide that information to the ordinance committee. Now, I did I did try to reach out to Ben Travers, the chair of the ordinance committee today, and I have not spoken with him, so I don't know what. They how they would like to receive our work product, but um, you know the it may be written narrative. It may be a joint committee meeting where we could uh, convey what um, what we've done and allow them to to ask questions of us. Um, but it could be or, or all of the above. So I'm open to ideas about how we move forward. So. Um, I'll open it to the committee. Go ahead, Gene. So I have submitted an amendments, and I would like the, our committee to consider those and vote on them. If we have, I, I think that I would prefer that if we, if they pass, even if it is two to one, but clearly if it's if it's if it's unanimous, I would like that to be reflected in a draft that would go to um, to the ordinance committee. If it is a two to one, I think that it would be helpful to have it reflected in a draft, but to make sure that the ordinance committee sees the minority report so that they get the full, you know, benefit of what we do. And if my amendments and anybody else's amendments fail, then it doesn't get marked up or changed, but the you know, um, there be an opportunity to present that the, the amendment was was made, it was defeated, 
and then if uh, and perhaps this could be done i have done some um written explanations that i haven't shared it's been more oral things than but that we maybe take some time to be able to provide our reasoning and, and that would include if if an amendment passes and obviously i'm not the only one who uh, can and maybe will produ uh, produce produce um, an amendment um so that's the way that i would like to proceed with the the text um i also would just like i i think that the medical centers questions were great i think they're absolutely essential for us to be able to answer clearly and i think that there are many answers that the many questions that can be answered and you deserve that everybody who would be looking to uh, to install a system change fix the system needs to understand that uvm in a, in a similar state and so i think that somewhere along the line we should provide those so that it's part of the record i'm not and, and those things then also would get transmitted to uh, to the ordinance committee that way you know we're we're not for you know our work isn't wasted and, and it's not like it, it's not going to be meaningful to them so um yeah i think that's good anna do you have um thoughts on this i think it's fine to do it the way that jean just presented so so, so I'm clear. Um, so we would we have we start with the referred ordinance, and we do uh, red line markup uh, that would reflect the amendments and the the various votes on those amendments. Yes, I think so. And hand that in its entirety to um, to the ordinance committee. I think I would think it would be important for the ordinance committee to see those things that failed as well as yes. those things that passed, and whether they were passed unanimously or Yes. Um, on, on, or otherwise. So, yes, I, I, I agree with that. I think that they should get the full benefit, the full benefit. of the committee's um, deliberations. Because we're just three counselors of a council of 12, and um, yeah. we shouldn't assume that um, you're the last word. Abs absolutely not. Okay, that seems, that seems good. Um, I have not looked at your amendments and i'm assuming they're along the lines of the ones we were discussing last week and that we i made some very few what i consider to be tweaks that were posted that are posted for those who can go online there i i didn't I haven't seen them online but maddie tells me they're online and mm -hmm. they are very consistent with what was done um last week there are and and I tried to be um, to the extent to which they reflect some sort of changes based on um, comments or proposals or questions that were were raised. Um, Darren provided things. Nick provided something. Mike Porter provided something. I read the VGS, wherever Dylan is behind the medical center. I read. The medical center, I read the UVM papers, so I, I tried to, to consider them, uh, although it's not likely that with the exception, the, the biggest one has to do with the certification um, and, uh, and a piece on, up here. <clears throat> on uh, 145 through 154, but it will, it's got some extra things to it. So, um, there. Um, so I had I had prior to the meeting looked at the various uh, correspondence that weighed in on um, different parts that we had deliberated on um, in our last meeting. And so I've come into this meeting sort of with sort of a framework of the way I'm going to. I'm just going to tell everybody up front how I, I'm sort of uh, leaning on most of these things. Um, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that once enacted, we're joining a small select group of cities that even places a fee on carbon. So we should be proud of that fact, regardless if we get all of the all the things that that people want. Um, 
Yeah, I also want to recognize that the draft that came to our committee is the result of significant stakeholder engagement, including institutions like UVM and UVMMC who are here tonight that have significant thermal needs and are potentially significantly impacted by that. So I'm mindful of that and, and appreciative of them being here tonight. Um, the draft that's come to us has also been aligned uh, well with state efforts. Um, and, you know, we've heard differing opinions on whether or not that, that there's, there's merit in that or not. I believe that there is. Um, and so I, I like that we're aligned with the state and we're not totally forging our own path. So that's sort of where, where I'm at in a broad way. That said, um, I am open to some of the technical changes, how this will be paid for. Um, the, uh, the administration will be paid for. And um, I'm also open to prioritizing the use of revenue um, that's collected in the thermal sector, um, as we had discussed last time, recognizing that, you know, as a second, you know, if, if at all, I'll use all the money there, but if there are capital needs for fleet that we um, sort of consider that a secondary use. And I am not sure how that language should look. So that's generally in a broad way, the way I, I'm thinking about this here tonight. But that said, I'm happy to, if you want to lead us through a discussion going through from sure. front to back. Sure. Okay. So let me get it up here. And perhaps Maddie, you could post the uh, the latest edition. The, the, my amendments is that what uh, I think it's that's this document. Yeah, that is that document. That's and the one that's on the online. the Tuk, uh, page uh, meeting for tonight. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. the only thing, just so uh, what I did was take the uh, the prior, um, you know, like summary, so to speak, or you know, like the just the actual changes, and to the extent to which I added something. Uh, Today it's in bold and underlined. So then, just a quick question before we get started: Would folks like some lights on back here? We're for energy efficiency, but we can turn some lights on. Chris, do you mind <laughs> just on the back panel there? There's. Uh, I, I realize we got a lot of people. In the yeah. No. I appreciate that. My eyes are getting old. We should be able to. These are LEDs, very efficient. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. And. I don't know, Maddie, if you can go back and forth between this proposal and then the actual draft that came to us. So that we can see here. So. I can pull them up both side by side. It's just going to be small. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, I think that if, if just sort of like maybe back and forth. Back. Okay be good enough. So as you can see, the first um, proposal that I have is um, virtually the same as what was proposed and many people have commented on the, um, uh, the deletion of line 35 and its replacement with thermal energy from exclusively non-renewable, non-fossil fuel sources. Um, that, and then this is new from today, that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And that is to close the inadvertent loophole that I think that you created by not doing that. And that is consistent with what Nick had pointed out. And then such as, so that is the first. And Manny, can, can you get the, there you go to line 35. I have Maybe you can, I, have, I can have it too, but if other people. That's better, I mean, for the, for the public. Um, I would like to ask, because uh, uh, yep. GM Springer weighed in on this in a communication to us, which I think is on also on the two page. Could you weigh in on, because there's uh, this, this notion of exclusively renewable, which is a change from the language. Could you give us your thoughts on that? Yes, thank you. And, um, you know, preface any comments I offer by saying we did do a very extensive process leading up to the point of, of creating the, the, the proposal here, uh, both two town meeting day votes, number of reports to the city council, NPA meetings, stakeholder meetings. So everything is informed by a lot of the process that really came before. 
Um, I think the concern would be uh, on this particular change is I'm not 100% clear how it impacts uh, in the real world when we actually go to implement. And so I think the, the current language uh, talks about, you know, a system that relies on thermal energy from, and then it spells out what are the sources that we're talking about. And I think um, if we spell it out in terms of, uh, you know, exclusively, I think there was even a, a public comment last time that suggested even electrification might have some challenge with that definition. And certainly electrification, I think, is intended to be one of the eligible uh, uses here. So I'm not clear the language is needed to effectuate the policy. I think we're trying to spell out what resources here are renewable, non-fossil, and count uh, for the purposes of the ordinance. I know there's a subsequent amendment that would debate those, those sources themselves. Um, I think the, so the language could potentially create some sort of unintended consequence. That was my concern that I tried to articulate in the email. I have a question. I appreciate you bringing them these also for us in this form because it makes it easier than trying to go through the various pieces of uh, the other recommendations that others have made and that we discussed the last period. So thank you for, for doing this. Um, I, I just have a question. If do you do you think of this amendment and the next elite lines 52 to 65 as being uh, sort of a package or I, I think they they are a package and you read them as a whole. And um, I, I think that's the proper statutory construction as well as the, the common, uh, common sense, which is also part of statutory right. construction. So yes, I, I do. I think it's just trying to um, get, um, get real clarity, which is why, like I said, I, um, added the extra words uh, today when I looked at it and realized that uh, there, there is some ambiguity that would allow non-fossil fuel sources that don't reduce emissions from being subject to, to so, the fee. So, so as we discussed them here in committee, we should be considering them, we maybe should be considering them together. Well, I think you consider this as being the entire section. So if Maddie goes up, on the, uh, the the actual draft to B, right? I think that you read 32, uh, line 32 mm -hmm. through all the way down to line 70 as a coherent whole. And the reason not to put it all into sort of one thing is because it's separated and it just makes it easier to say, okay, we just want to make this absolutely clear what is, um, what's appropriate for this proposal. Um, and um, yeah, so um, yes, I do see them and we can get into in part the, uh, the, the proposal to, to eliminate uh, I guess it is four through seven as, uh, um, you know, if you want, but I, 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 I think you can, that this can stand alone as an amendment. And so it is offered as a standalone amendment, even though, and, and yeah, um, I, I do think that um, this language this proposed would be consistent even if you did not eliminate numbers four through seven. I, I don't see that creating an ambiguity because in fact, that's sort of what it is uh, is doing anyway. But I know I got a lawyer on the other side of the table too, so. So, so I'm not supportive of this change uh, for, for two reasons. This is like, the main change we've been talking about to um, through a lot of the public comment. There's the one that the alignment with. Um, no, you're talking about the four through the. Uh, yeah, I'm talking. So about I so I, although I do see them as one, I, I think that they should be um, considered separately. Fifty-two to sixty-five. Yeah. Right. Um, well, I, I. So. But. Yeah, I, I, I'm treating them as a whole because the 
the language that they sort of they sort of pull together. Right? So I would be okay with treating them together, make it easier for our conversation. I, I would like. To, I haven't really talked about the the deletion of it, so maybe okay, I. Could, do you want to talk about? Yeah, that let me now? just let me just lay it out, and you know, um, so there's a lot been said about aligning with the state law. But the fact of the matter is that the state law is still in development. And I look at this, the metaphor that I've got with the existing is the, the letting the horses run free with the, the, you know, let the barn door being opened. And then in a, in a subsequent section, we maybe close it if it's to be closed. I think it is essential that we start small and we look and see what the results of that state law um, process is going to be. And I think that we need to truly look at that and then relook at this law and integrate what, ha what is happening on the state level in, um, in a real and thoughtful way. That is going, they're gonna come up with life cycle emission rates. It's a year and a quarter quarter away from doing, from even a draft, maybe it's a, a year and two months, right? From even having draft regulations. And um, I really see no reason as opening the barn door at this point in time for these sources. And I'm not convinced based on my conversations with folks that um, there is going to be a lot of activity that will be uh, foreclosed. Clearly not in the green hydrogen. We've heard testimony about that. Um, I'm, yeah, um, not sure about the biodiesel as, as well as being a, a significant source for the new buildings and the retrofitting that we're hearing, we might hear testimony to the contrary of that. And um, I have issues along the lines of what climate folks have said that um, I have serious issues with the continued um, support for the burning of wood and um, issues with with the renewable gas um, as it relates to the systems. And uh, there are some interest there. The medical center raised an interesting uh, point about fuel cells that are, you know, fueled by natural gas. I think it's an excellent question to, to raise. And I, I'm sort of open to that, that conversation, but Otherwise, um, I'm, I'm just not in favor, and I don't think that we should be incentivizing them. So that is the, uh, the basic reasons for my proposal to eliminate them and to have a coherent um, section that, that does that. Um, Hannah, do you have thoughts? Um, I am not in favor of deleting the lines. I I mean, I think later on in the ordinance, it literally says that we are going to complement our policy with what the state decides. And so I think it's important to, to wait and figure out what they, they could very well decide not to include these. And, you know, it protects us already because it's in the ordinance. So right now, as it stands, I'm not in support of deleting them. I'm not in, in favor either. And um, part of my reason is for I already articulated about alignment, but also the, the um, our authority is really around limiting uh, fossil fuels and not, and not non-fossil fuels. So these are not, these things would be, these things would be permitted because they're not within our authority to uh, the current, the current authority we have for motors. Well, we have authority to regulate uh, non-fossil fuels. We don't have the authority to 
put a fee on them, uh, but we clearly, um, and we can march down to see how this all works uh, as we march down. Um, but we should not conflate the authority to regulate, which we do have, and the authority to um, impose a fee. Understood. But the, I mean, yeah, I understand that. But this is really about imposing. This ordinance is about imposing a fee and the framework for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am not supportive of these, but I, I appreciate and, and, your yep, comments. Yep, yep. And you know, I mean, fundamentally, I I would like there to be votes. I hear, you know, I I, so I know how to count we can, one we can, and two, but I, you know, uh, I I think that okay. this is an official thing that we get on record. And yep. Let's do that then. Um, so we're voting on uh, the first group. Uh, it would be the delete line 35 and the delete lines 50, uh, the replacement of line 35 and the deletion of 50, 52 to 65. That is correct. Okay. Um, all those in favor of those? Aye. All those opposed? Aye. No. Her, no. I guess. Okay, so we got you. So that doesn't mean that ordinance may take a different. I, 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 I I'm good with whatever we do. I you know I think it's important for us to to march through these. Okay, and any I agree. Them. And uh, and I appreciate the time and the thought that people are are giving it. The next one is just to correct a, a typo on line sixty eight. I would dismiss anybody who would oppose that as not being so somebody to be listening to. Okay. Yeah. That seems like a one that I could support. I would hope so. Okay. So we are correcting a typo on line 68. More. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, the, the next one is actually a new one. It relates to the um in 72 it is the disqualification um of uh fuels that are um deemed by the the puc to not satisfy the carbon intensity requirements of the clean heat standard or any similar state uh, this was a, um, a request for a change that Pike Porter raised uh, today, and I think it makes perfect sense. I don't know why we would be giving the discretion to uh, the Department of Permitting and Inspections when a, um, a fuel has... Um, Failed to satisfy those state requirements that we are saying are, you know, are, are so important that we need to follow and be in harmony for. So, um, if you if you let the if you let the the dogs out, but then you decide that they need to come in, you should be able and you should like make sure they get back in the house and then you close the door, and not let somebody go. Oh, well, I don't know. So um, this is a section we discussed in, I think, last time, and I had asked about the necessity for this section, and uh, Jim Springer had, had indicated um, that this gave us that, that ability to disqualify these fuels at when the, uh, the PUC said they didn't meet that carbon intensity. Yeah. Um, so the difference from shell, from May to shell, I mean, um, I would... I just would like to know your thoughts on that. Um, I'm commenting on the fly here because I hadn't seen this uh, previously, but um, I think particularly if you're keeping uh, the other sections as you've decided to do for for now, and, and you know we would advocate for that um, uh, as being part of a broad policy, then um, you know if you change the made a shell, uh, you know you're basically saying even if a fuel was renewable if the PUC process around the clean heat standards ultimately adopted decides that the fuel doesn't meet the carbon intensity requirements, you're not gonna allow it to meet here. I, 
I don't have a concern with that. Um, I think it will potentially, we'll, we'll have to monitor that going forward because it could create some uh, scenarios where our authorities and our policy is not quite aligned uh, 100%, but I think we have time to look at that in the future. So I don't have a concern about changing May to shall in this case. In, in my view, it would keep us, it would, it would necessitate that we stay aligned. Yep. You know? Yeah, no so, concern. So I, I could support this. I'm also supportive of it. Okay. Cool. So uh, all those in favor of re replacing the, the, of the proposed amendment on line 72 to replace may with shall. Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay. Now we're talking the next, the next the next, next amendment one is uh, oh. amend line 73. And I think that. We just did that. Remember? No, this oh, is so the next right. line. Yes. Uh, and this is just I, I, to, to create, a, to, to correct. I, I see this as a technical correction because um, really the requirements, this is. This is a definitions section, um, um, and so I'm not seeing that the reference on line 73 to this section is the correct reference. Um, that really it's the requirements of uh, the section um, 878 which is the, the application of this that uh, we're looking to do. So I just think that that was in effect, uh, um, maybe it was, they were thinking about it in terms of, you know, we're looking at the entire ordinance and thinking of it as one section with like maybe these subsections, but in, in fact, uh, this ordinance is broken up into different quote unquote sections. So the way it, it's applied is in 878, 877, section 877 is merely a definitional section. So that, this was me just trying to clean stuff up. I'm in support of changing that. I think I am. I'm just trying to make sure I totally understand what you're doing. So there are there are no requirements in this section. So referring to it doesn't make any sense. Okay. And we should fix stuff that doesn't make any sense. No, I, I can be supportive of that as well. So I'm just having I need to make this bigger. I'm having a hard time here. There we go. So um, all those in favor of the uh, the change recommended on line 73 and basically it's just it really is just the underlying section of this is the same as from last week which is right. really basically it, it changes it deletes this section and says section 8-78 for fuels that reduce greenhouse emissions uh, so all those in favor of this change aye, aye. aye. Okay. The, the next section is a is the big modification if you discount the a big, big modification from last week's and this is sort of based on um, a combination of responses that I tried to work through um, to comments that Darren sent. Uh, in particular <clears throat> regarding life cycle, you know, the, the lifetime uh, contracts, which correct me if I'm wrong, you said we don't, don't exist. And so we had talked about it in that regard and uh, Darren expressed some openness and interest in an annual certification, which I had raised as being a level of administration that we just need to be prepared 
to administer, um, but that um, I was like open to it and then tried to just figure out how. And so based on what Darren was saying, um, I, uh, I crafted this, it's a little bit more complicated. Well, it, it does keep what, and this actually was first uh, proposed by Jack Hansen in terms of the um, deliver, it really, and I didn't number the lines, but one, two, three, four, on the fifth line of the new language, uh, Jack had proposed and I, am proposing the direct delivery to the building's um, thermal energy system. So that continues to be in play. I did not um, change that. And um, I, I know, and you should hear from Darren about his concerns on that. And I think Dylan um, and VGF have expressed um, concerns as well. Um, but so that stayed. Um, but then um, the, there is a, a, a piece here I tried to bring in language related to the annual certification and just made sure that a certification also has supporting documents. That's a little bit different, but you know, the trust but verify. And uh, for those who don't know, I was the code enforcement director for the city of Burlington on two separate occasions and was their attorney for 20 years. And I know how important it is that we get proper facts to support what people say is the truth. And we can get them. It just so that's 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 why uh, documents documentary proof is included on there. I just think it will make the administration straightforward and much more simpler. And um, the very the, the original proposal inadvertently um, eliminated a, a section that um, said that the um, if the if the applicant failed to provide an annual compliance certificate, the applicant will be assessed a, an alternative compliance carbon pollution impact fee equal to to a pro rata share of the remaining expected life of the thermal energy system. That was actually, that's basically what's in the ordinance now, but in the proposal to delete, it got eliminated and make, that makes no sense at all because that is something that we have to prepare for. So I tried to put it in that. And then there was um, a comment that Darren made related to the, liquid or gaseous food fuels being used in multi in like dual use, dual fuel appliances and uh, he certain he suggested a, a new line in addition to some other lines and i just cut and paste that and put that in, in the bottom because i think that um that closes a, a loophole in that so Fundamentally, this is a, a proposal to make sure that the, the appliances are getting the fuels uh, directly from these sources. It, it, I think it does create issues with the renewable natural gas, for example, but you know my position on renewable natural gas, so it's not inconsistent with that. I know what the committee has done with regard to that, but I, um, continue to uh, to propose it. And this is probably, and I'm not going to negotiate against myself, so I'll be quiet. Um, I, I, I wish we could tease this apart a little bit, and maybe we can. Um, but like, so the directly delivered, the issue is, and please, uh, I'll look to uh, Dylan and, and Darren to correct me if I'm wrong. But the fact is the renewable natural gas is gonna have some component that's a fossil gas and some component that is renewable based on um, based on the, I mean, it's basically gonna be how the end, end user buys it, right? Will they be able to buy renewable, one, one kind of renewable natural gas that'll be a blend of, and I'll ask this, I guess, to, to Dylan since he's here. 
Yeah, sure. With regard to renewable natural gas, um, there are two options right now. We have a voluntary program where a customer can opt to buy a percentage. They are paying a premium for that product. Uh, and in so doing, just so you're aware, at the state level, the way that our regulators have done it so far, we procure volumes of renewable natural gas. We have in-state sources. We have sources from out of state. We have a North American gas grid. It's interconnected. Uh, those projects, the molecules from either the biomethane source, whatever it might be, are injected into the pipeline, um, but it's commingled. The molecules of that gas are there with fossil gas, uh, ostensibly. However, a customer can opt to purchase a volume, which we have a contract uh, with that individual, and we have a contract with the sourcer who is providing that gas to us when we buy volumes of it. So in terms of the gas that moves through the meter or is at the burner kit, um, it's really dependent upon the supply mix at a given point. So this requirement isn't consistent with the way that sort of a grid-based energy system works. You cannot track a molecule, but we have a requirement, and now we have it in law with the Affordable Heat Act, where we have to uh, account for both that attribute of molecule if we want to claim credits. And we, we have done that. That's been our practice so far. Thank you. Um, I also know we heard testimony from U UVM MC that, that this is part of their, uh, their strategy, um, is to have renewable gas. So this would seem to, to undermine that as well. Um, but that's, but so the directly delivered part, um, I, it can't be supportive of. Um, some of the other compl annual compliance certification, um, and I've talked to Darren about this, it seems like we need to work on that some more anyway. So, there are some scenarios that, uh, I mean, it's hard because it isn't a tax um, that you're going to pay every year. You have to pay it once. Um, and so that, that creates challenges. Um, even in, I think in the, in the uh, list of questions that uh, UVMC sent over, they had asked what happens um, in a couple of their scenarios. One was with uh, temporary systems or they upgraded a system. So I am not, um, I am not sure if this is the right language or not for the um, compliance certification, um, but I know that that's an area of this ordinance that it seems like we, we could still use a little bit of work on. So, I mean, my suggestion, I, I, I'm sorry if I cut off no, Hannah, but would, would be that if there is a piece that, um, there, you know, that it is clearly objectionable that there be like a, a motion to delete something and then there's okay. a vote on that. And then if it is deleted, then you can work through. I, I, I do think that this process does need more work, um, but it's easiest if we can at least, you know, figure out what needs work and what doesn't. So that would be the, I, I think. Um, so I would then move to strike just the directly, um, the word directly, because that would return it to its original form. I would second that. Okay. I will vote against that, but. So that passes, passes two, to, two one. to one. And then we're still considering the rest of this. And I would like, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts because you've given a lot of, um, you've done a lot of thinking on the, uh, the compliance piece. Thank you. Um, I agree with removing the word directly. I, I <clears throat> want to confirm that we agree that being delivered to the building's thermal energy system still would kind of include that grid compliance that Dylan was suggesting. And I would offer that where we have the words kind of, but not limited to a contract and invoices, we probably want some language in there that talks about tariff because the way you subscribe to renewable gas is through a voluntary tariff at the moment. And I want to correct, you know, something from earlier, you know, and I've said this before, we're municipal public power mm -hmm. utility. We don't make profits. We're not a corporation and we don't sell renewable natural gas. So our interest in this is not, uh, in that way, but it's really just in ensuring that there are options for affected stakeholders like the medical center, like UVM, who may need this as part of their broader effort to get off of fossil fuel. Um, so we support having it as part of the mix. Um, so I, I would offer that as long as 
being delivered to the building's thermal energy system is understood to include, you know, a voluntary purchase of renewable gas, knowing that that's not a molecule, but that that's a, a tariff uh, provision. Um, that would be one piece that I would flag. Would that, if I could ask, would, I, would the, the language of a contract cover that? Or would you, is there a, a need to be more specific in terms of using the words like tariff? I think we could, because I don't believe it's a contract necessarily. In some cases, as a as a customer, you can subscribe via a tariff. Um, and then annual compliance could be that we get demonstrated compliance because the customer or the fuel company is able to show us that the customer paid the tariff for the amount of fuel necessary to offset their annual use. And there's a document that that is like labeled tariff. That... It could be it could be their bill that shows that they have a line item tariff. Uh, so the invoice, but I think was what I was trying. It was the, was the language that I was trying to use. Uh, I'm in favor of this working. <laughs> so we that, support we support the annual yeah. compliance option yeah. for this approach. So if there's if there is a, a language that just will suss out what things may not be covered by uh, contract and invoices. And I, maybe I would add to contract and invoices, um, and you're saying including but not limited to, so obviously the department has additional options for looking at compliance, but um, perhaps add, um, you know, uh, participation in a, in a tariff program or something to that effect. Um, that, that would probably cover it. But I'm not typing it in, but I, I, I mean, I think that... Uh, when, once you've let the door open to doing this, you want to make sure that the system is going to work. Um, and okay. from my standpoint, that this then is the assurance that that is continuing, um, that we can have annual compliance. So, 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 so might we add um, <clears throat> after the, the word, invoices and uh, subscription to tariffs yeah a subscription or participation in a tariff program i think would be there you go you and maddie if maddie is typing that and participation in the tariff program. program comma so i think that means deleting the the and in between contract and invoices put the comma that then putting the and i'm sorry no that's good So, <coughs> job, do you have contract easier. invoices and subscription or participation in a tariff program, or do we not need subscription and participation? <laughs> Which one would you like to you read or keep it? Is it there? Limited to a contract invoices and subscription or participation in a tariff program. I was think you, were you suggesting contract, comma, invoices? Invoices, yes. comma, and yeah. participation, so that that's all one concept. Participation's in the term. So with that change, um, Hannah, do you have thoughts? I would be fine with making those changes. Okay. Well, then we have these changes. All those in favor? Me. Aye. Aye. So that group of changes passes. Are we on to the next? On to the next one. Uh, the deletion of lines 156 through 160. Uh, this is basically to not not um, exempt those folks who have already done what uh, they've done something in their their buildings and uh, in a way reward them from that. I think that the compelling reason is that we just need to do a whole lot more, and I don't. I, this is, it, 
if they're exempt, then they're going to be able to uh, to put in whatever systems they they want. This is going to go into effect uh, now. I don't know how many buildings it will um, impact before it goes into effect. It's a fairly, um, I think, short window, and uh, <clears throat> buildings that are um, under permit now are already not subject to that. So um, it just makes most sense to me that we not encourage uh, more fossil fuel use, more greenhouse gas emissions. And I, I think that this is not the incentive that, uh, uh, that we want to give. I think it actually is a sort of a perverse incentive. Yeah. Uh, the concern here, I, I believe that we've heard articulated is that it would um, take away an incentive for building owners to take early action. Is that is that an accurate, accurate characterization? Yeah, we, we're very supportive of retaining the provision. Um, and it was a product of a lot of those stakeholder conversations. And we are dealing with stakeholders who may have, in some cases, multiple buildings, many buildings many of which are not subject to this ordinance because they're not at the square footage threshold, perhaps, uh, but they may be part of a portfolio of buildings owned by a single entity. And we are reaching beyond the bounds of this ordinance in a way with the early credit provision to say, if you're taking steps beyond what we're requiring you to do, there's going to be a value. And if you were a portfolio manager for that entity, you might say, well, I've got a building here that's going to be really hard to, to address. I may need a conventional system in that building, but I'm going to do other things in this other building that's going to reduce more quickly uh, because maybe their compliance isn't going to happen for seven years. They want to build up some credit. If we're of the mindset, and I've heard this articulated a number of times, that the action within the next uh, seven years is important from a scientific standpoint, this incentivizes action now as opposed to waiting for somebody to have to pull a permit. And that's why we're, we're strongly supportive of it. Um, you know, I could understand from the standpoint, if you wanted to change the date from 2023 to 2024, given that we're, we didn't know when we were going to be taking this up when, when we were originally looking at this. And so obviously you're not going to impact things that happen in January of 23, but you might impact things that are going to happen in January of 24. If this takes effect, then I could, I could certainly understand that rationale. And we would be okay and supportive of that change, but retaining the provision here is, is important early action uh, incentive in our view. Thank you. Um, I think I would like to keep it at least for now. That's just me. Hannah, do you have thoughts on this? Um, I also am in support of keeping it and really my reasoning is because I think what Darren has presented to us is compelling, especially with the fact that they have said that this could end up helping reduce emissions at an even greater impact than um, originally intended. So I think that's important. Okay, so um, yeah. Um, could you um, repeat what the, the date change? So here it's offering credit for renewable fuels that reduce greenhouse gas and uh, used for any thermal system in place since January 1, 2023. I think it could be a very rational change to change that date to January 1, 2024, if you'd like to, uh, under the rationale that the ordinance hasn't been in effect at the time frame. You know, you, you don't have to reach back a year. You can start when the ordinance goes into effect and incentivize action there if you if you prefer that approach. I think that makes sense. Um, that would be preferable. I still think, you know, I know money is important in things when all is said and done. Um, but folks who are going to be doing it on those other buildings, there are a lot of good reasons for folks to be doing that, not the least of which are in the smaller buildings, the ones that are easier, um, not the least of which is all of the supports that we're giving to people to do that work. It's sort of like a double dip. Um, so I'd ask you guys to reconsider, but if you're not inclined, then I think moving the date 
would be um, would be important. I would be open to moving the date. I would as well. So the uh, 2025. I think it was four. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was just a cheap shot. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the change then um, is not the deletion, but just the, the change from 2023 to 2024. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, so, Oops, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna vote yes in favor of the change to January 2024. So. Is that the only thing we're changing? So yes. There we go. You got a unanimous. Uh, you have unanimous. We got unanimity. We like unanimity. Yeah. When we can get it. When we can get it. Okay. Uh, the the next one is um, so adding uh, to line one sixty three. Accept those funds needed to administer this ordinance. And we had this um, conversation last uh, week. I'm, I'm supportive. <clears throat> I am. Yeah. So uh, all those in favor of uh, amending line 163. Aye. Aye. OK. Um, the next one is uh, the, come on, stop doing this to me. It is to um, amend line 70, 174 and 175 by adding the word city of Burlington after the word site and before the word owned. The purpose of this is uh, basically this is credits for um, business for building owners and we want to I think make sure that they are uh, it buildings in Burlington themselves. This is a um, fee that's being charged on Burlington properties and it should serve Burlington owners and renters. This is a point that Nick made. That I think we had just overlooked and it opens a door, which is I think way too far, too, too much. I, I'm supportive of this amendment. I am too. So all those in favor of adding the word city of Burlington after the word site? Aye. On, 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 on one seventy four, one seventy five. Aye. Uh, and the very last one is a deletion of line one ninety one, which is the um, allowance of the fee of the fund, the clean energy fund, to be used to subsidize the cost of converting the city's vehicle fleet from fossil fuel. To electric. Um, I am in favor of doing that if the, um, but I don't, I think it's premature. And this is a building um, uh, fee and it's meant to assist people with buildings to do the work in the buildings and the, the residents and low income folks and um, at least at the very onset of the. Um, uh, of the development of the ordinance, we should not be converting that money to the city's um, capital needs. So that is why I uh, propose this. I've been supportive of this in the past, and I've heard the the capital committee tell me the reasons why it's needed. Um, but I'm I am also in support of this. If this if this uh, revenue is being raised. Uh, to address the thermal sector uh, carbon goals we have, we should use the money there. So I, I could be supportive of this. I think we'll hear otherwise once this gets mm -hmm. uh, to ordinance um, and maybe even beyond, but I'm, um, I'm supportive of this right now. I am too. Good. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 There. Aye. So that completes my uh, my list of uh, amendments, I thank you for your indulgence. And I actually thank everybody here who weighed in 
on stuff that's really helpful. You know, like uh, it's not often that government works, and that means we've got to sit down and deal with the details. And I say that I, I don't know if we have the time or the desire, but I do think that answers to UVM's question, UVM MC's questions need to be done and perhaps we could ask uh, BED staff to take a stab at that and provide something in the next, you know, for our meeting in, in terms of a written communication in the next uh, week or the, uh, you know, if that's too ambitious. Uh, I guess, I, well, I was curious because I had assumed perhaps that um, some of the concerns that were raised might be uh, kind of considered in ordinance. Uh, so I didn't know if we wanted to try to address some of the items there. If, if, to, if sending the item to ordinance, um, we'd be happy to work further in the committee to try to address some of the very good questions that were raised. I would love for us to understand this. Um, uh, this is about the mechanics. You know, I, I was a staff person for ordinance for a really long time. And uh, so I, I, I get geeky with this stuff and the okay. fact that it's here is... Are you suggesting that before we pass it to ordinance that we would... I would at least like to see it and be able to weigh in. I'm not sure that we need to do that. I'm also not sure that ordinance is ready to sort of jump if, you know, Ben has got a hold of it. We got the joint committee going on. But I, 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 I at least want to be able to, to, to see and then comment and provide instead of just like, okay, here, you guys do it. You know, you've got it. You go take care of it. Could, could I, um, well, um, I think a week is a little too quick, just given some of the other workload that we have. Um, I'd be interested to understand, and if it is going to be a, a two ordinance meeting, uh, I know you described earlier or not, I'd be happy to work up some responses and share them with both committees. Um, I, I would not want to hold you up from, from formally moving the item if that's what you're inclined to do, but I'd be happy to work up written responses, share them with both committees. And obviously all the committee members are going to have additional opportunity to you know, further uh, weigh in and amend if needed. I just don't want to hold up the process knowing we want to have this in place well in advance of uh, implementation uh, in, in 2024, if possible. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't have any more amendments. I think everybody, I mean, you, you know, has weighed in and the public and knows, you know, we know where people are standing. We've had these votes on the, the fundamental thing. So I'm not in favor of holding this up for what we've got, um, having a new set of um, uh, new set of questions that implicate the provisions that we've looked at and, and the, the process. You're talking about in the UVM? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, is a, um, you know, is something um, from an, and those are, those are clearly on one hand more ordinance related, but this committee has jurisdiction over basically the way that the city is um, dealing with um, climate change and it's a, um, it includes the administration of it. So, you know, I, I, I it, 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 we are a, a place that needs to make sure that this is all working, the systems are working. We, we certainly commit that, you know, even if you want to move the item to ordinance from a process standpoint, we'll provide written responses to two and ordinance and of course you'd be a medical. Um, and if, if there's further refinement that's needed as a result of that, we would pursue it both in ordinance and at the full council as needed. I'd be okay with that. I would as well. I, um, one of my concerns is that are, do any of these questions point out um, um, areas of the ordinance that is incomplete and needs to be to be filled in like the, even like the one around um, if you're running renewable natural gas but provision and run oil so do we need something about primary systems or something or you know and how do we do the accounting around those things so I'm I'm keenly interested in the answers to these and how they may or may not affect the ordinance. other ones I think are fairly straightforward like where the where the 
fees for permitting to be applied. That seems like it would be building building permits, yep. um, not zoning. So that yep. some of these are obvious, others are not, and and ask in um, present other questions for the ordinance itself. So um, interested in how that goes. I have also don't want to hold it up, um, but uh, but definitely I'm wanting to see how these progress. So as long as we can get answers like you had uh, suggested, um, and I, I intend to attend some of the ordinance meetings as well, the way in, so. Um, Hannah, do you have thoughts? Um, I'm, I'm fine with that timeline that you both just talked about. Okay, so um, with that, would we move our, I, I don't know what work product Ben in, in ordinance wants, um, whether we need to package everything or just send in our amend, amendments. Um, I, think I, I would, I would, ask, everything. I, I would ask that we have a document that has a, is a markup with the work that of, of amendments and they would, so that they can get what was first read and sent to us. There's a, that's a document. This would be a second document that with the amendments by this committee after deliberation, the, if they can get the minutes that would reflect the votes and the, the, the discussion, uh, that would be really helpful. Um, and then we've got a memo that will come to them, but also to us related to these implementation. Uh, I think that, you know, that plus the minutes that detail the, uh, you know, the three meeting, three meetings, we three, three, four, three, three meetings. If they get, if they got all that, they'll not look at any of it. And they just, may not. I mean, they'll just look at the at the document that we are sending them now. If I, if I were to bet, right. But if we have all the good backup work that has been submitted yep. by yep. others, yep. Um, I would encourage them and point them to that. And, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss with Ben the best way. Obviously, we have two web page that we can point people at, but there may be another way to sort of index that maybe for some of these, um, um, some of the issues. Would you like us to work with the city attorney's office to produce a red line draft of the amendments? A red line draft of the well, ordinance with, with as amended by as, amended as proposed to be amended by us. I think that that would be okay. really helpful. Okay, we'll do. I took notes as well. I know Patty took notes. We'll coordinate. Okay. I mean, if, if there weren't that many changes, and uh, very sure they make it yeah, they make it really clear, and uh, we don't want them to go backwards and re have to over we did. I don't think they'll want to either. No. Um, and this is a starting point. Um, doesn't mean that this won't get revisited, um, you know, with another, another, uh, another time for the voters to weigh in to see if they want to yeah. make things uh, even more uh, strict or, or to make other changes. So. Yeah. Yeah. So um, do we need a, a formal motion on this or? So I move the um, referral to the ordinance committee of the um, ordinance as amended by the, this committee, along with uh, all of the, the documents um, that are pertinent to that minutes. Um, and, uh, and the like, I guess that is it, minutes. Um, uh, maybe a, uh, just an, and a, um, a, a, a communication that lets them know that, that we have on our website, lots of documents. It links to the three, well, to the two web pages yeah. for the three meetings. So I would move, uh, move that um, to the, uh, for, for submission to the ordinance. I would second that. 
And uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm not, well, I guess. Does anybody have counselor updates tonight? I'm tired. Yeah, no. no? Um, next meeting uh, is currently scheduled for 22nd, which is next Tuesday. Um, the only thing on the agenda at the moment is Nick from the airport is coming to talk to us. Um, but I'm talking to Chayden tomorrow, and well, there may be other things. Um, and with no further business, I'll adjourn us at, and no objection, I'll adjourn us at 716. So I'm 45 minutes late. Sorry, guys. Sorry, folks. But we're way shorter than last night. Would you, in your looking at their memo, look at the ordinance with regard to whether we would want to have um, a provision for regulations? Regulations. Regulations. You know, that, and rules that would help implement this. You know, like you gotta, if there, if there are little changes, you know, you want to, have the authority right. to make them 